We are very appreciative of not only our panelists, who you'll get to meet in a little while, but for our co-host, Senator Murphy of Connecticut, and Congressman Tim Ryan of Ohio's 13th District, and all of the wonderful efforts of their staff to put this event together. Under ESSA, states and districts have an opportunity to broaden their definitions of student success to include student social and emotional learning. Research shows that SEL is associated with higher test scores, increased graduation rates, and improved social behavior. Our panelists today will discuss how and why SEL increases college and career readiness, its important role in advancing equity, its connection to the nation's economic development, and how it can be supported. Before we move into the presentation, we'd like to welcome our co-host to make some opening remarks. We will have Senator Murphy joining us in a little while, so we'll make sure to stop to have um, to welcome him up to provide some, some comments. But Senator Murphy represents the state of Connecticut, uh, my home state. I'm especially proud to have him represent us. He's a member of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. He's a staunch advocate for civil rights and throughout the ESEA reauthorization process helped to ensure that the final law included some very important equity guardrails for historically underserved students, as well as a number of provisions uh, aimed at ending the school to prison pipeline. He successfully led the passage of a major mental health bill that he wrote and brought forward with bipartisan support in the previous administration. And you can see that Senator Murphy is surrounded by a family of educators uh, in, his, in his commitment and approach to education. Um, again, as someone from Connecticut, a state where the racial and economic divide is especially prevalent, um, it's an honor to have him represent the state and uh, the youth of our nation. So thank you very much to Senator Murphy and his staff for support. We are also doubly lucky to also have um, Congressman Ryan from Ohio's 13th District as a co-host for the event. Um, he is a member of the House Appropriations Committee and also a relentless advocate for working families in Northeast Ohio. Uh, he is a champion of efforts to make college more affordable, revitalize America's cities, and improve the health and well-being of America's families and children. He's also the author of A Mindful Nation, How a Simple Practice Can Help Us Reduce Stress, Improve Performance, and Recapture the American Spirit. He's introduced the social, um, the Academic Social and Emotional Learning Act, and provisions of that bill were included in the in ESSA, in the final version of ESSA to help expand and make the teaching of social emotional learning more effective. Uh, Representative Ryan has also advocated to support issues related to chronic absenteeism, teacher health, and wellness. Uh, Congressman Ryan walks the walk and uh, practices what he preaches, so we are especially honored to have uh, such wonderful co-hosts for this event. I would like to welcome up uh, Stephen Costio from his office to provide some comments on behalf of uh, the Congressman. Uh, good morning and thank you all for coming and thank you for the panel coming today to talk on such an important issue. Uh, Congressman Ryan wishes he could be here today, but as Jessica said, he's on the Appropriations Committee and is stuck in a markup right now. And so uh, how many teachers or people who used to teach do we have in the audience right now? Okay, quite a few. Well, I used to be a teacher and Congressman Ryan's wife uh, is a teacher. And so what you know and the feedback we've gotten from our constituents is that social emotional learning is really important in the classroom. And that's why last Congress, as Jessica said, uh, Congressman Ryan introduced the teacher health, uh, or he introduced the academic and social emotional learning act to have uh, language included in the Every Student Succeeds Act. And he's very excited that we're having this conversation today. Uh, this Congress, Congressman Ryan introduced the Chronic Absenteeism Reduction Act, and part of that bill goes towards social emotional learning programs that would get students uh, to come to school. Because what we know out of the 6.8 million students who are chronically absent, meaning they miss 10% or more of the school year, uh, that they need social emotional learning and to make better decisions. And one of those decisions is coming to school. And lastly, Congressman Ryan introduced the Teacher Health and Wellness Act. And part of that act funds a National Institute of Health study uh, to be able to not just look at what we know and help students get social emotional learning, but help give teachers the ability to have the professional development to deliver that to their students. Because the teachers in the room know uh, it can be a stressful place sometimes, so using that act to try to increase teacher retention and decrease teacher stress. And so social emotional learning is something that students need in the classroom today, and they can carry those skills into the workforce so that they can build positive relationships. And thank you to the Learning Policy Institute for putting this on, and looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you. 
Uh, before we move into our moderated discussion, I'd like to invite up Linda Darling-Hammond, Learning Policy Institute CEO and President, and Hannah Melnick, our research and policy associated, uh, to share with you how schools might be encouraged to help students develop socially, emotionally, and foster positive school climates in the context of new accountability and improvement systems under ESSA. <laughs> Well, thanks for being here. Um, it's wonderful to see all of this interest in social and emotional learning. Uh, we can always use it in the Congress and everywhere else. So it's great to have you all here. Uh, this briefing is to explain what social emotional learning is and to encourage policymakers to think about how to support it, uh, both through uh, the accountability and continuous improvement systems that ESSA uh, has really launched uh, as a, a new uh, framework in states um, and also in uh, both federal and local uh, context. This is the subject of our recent report encouraging SEL in the context of new accountability. Uh, many schools and districts have begun to focus on this kind of learning given compelling research on the science of learning and human development as well as the more flexible approach to accountability offered under ESSA. Uh, there are many different names for social emotional learning, uh, which are variously referred to as soft skills, uh, non-cognitive skills, co-cognitive skills, character education, and development, and so on. And some of the examples of the competencies uh, that we often think of as 21st century skills include communication, collaboration, problem solving, but also things like grit, perseverance, resilience, the ability to uh, work well with others uh, and to manage one's own um, uh, attention and focus and uh, energy. And you can see the uh, uh, framework that CASEL provides, self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and social awareness is one that many people use in thinking about social-emotional skills. Addressing social-emotional learning, we found through uh, meta-analyses of hundreds of studies, uh, actually leads to significantly higher achievement in school, higher graduation rates, safer schools, uh, prevention of bull bullying, less teacher stress, improved college and career ready skills, uh, and uh, the uh, life outcomes uh, that uh, occur really help disrupt the school to prison pipeline as well as preparing young people for college and careers. Uh, according to a 2013 survey of uh, employees, half of those surveys said they had uh, trouble finding recent graduates to fill vacancies uh, who actually had the communication, adaptability, decision-making, and problem-solving skills. In fact, if you look at what the five, top 500, Fortune 500 organizations, uh, corporations, call for in their employees. Uh, back uh, 50 years ago, it was reading, writing, and arithmetic that topped the list. Right now, it's interpersonal skills, communication, and collaboration, and teamwork that topped the list. So this is obviously something that uh, allows um, young people to be ready for the workforce. Uh, and supporting uh, social emotional learning in the classroom uh, is really something that can be integrated with academic skills. And it's not like it's something on to the side. You can see a little bit of this in this video, if it works for us. Well, let's go back. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? We're not sufficiently hooked up to the sound system uh, for that to, we are hooked up to a sound system, but it's not working. How to use manners and disagreeing, how to choose, mm -hmm. as simply as how to choose who, who speaks first. I'll carry it. In a fifth and sixth grade class, I mean, we, we wouldn't expect that, but boy, it can derail a classroom instantly. They don't have those So you can see what the kids are doing, but what the teacher is talking about is how, as he's teaching them to work together in a collaborative space, he's also helping them acquire the skills for the um, mathematics that they're working on uh, and um, the language to uh, ask each other's questions, collaborate in a productive way, and integrate that capacity to learn from each other rather than just kind of stepping on, on top of each other as part of their uh, regular work. 
Uh, and we see this in classrooms now across the entire country. There are many, many districts and a number of states that are supporting that integration of the skills into the academic um, process that they're engaged with. Uh, school climate is the foundation for social emotional learning and many states now under ESSA are integrating school climate measures into their examination of what schools are doing and how they're progressing. Uh, the positive school climate uh, when staff work together to create it is uh, safe, creates a sense of belonging, strong relationships, uh, it gets uh, Teachers working with each other around the tone and the experience that kids have of the school not only makes kids want to come to school, but also teaches them how to behave in relation to each other and enables them to learn in a much more productive way. Uh, social emotional learning can be taught through explicit instruction through a curriculum, but it's also kind of caught through observation, through the modeling that students see their peers and teachers engaged in in the school. When there's less disruption in classrooms, obviously learning can take place. Uh, when kids feel open to uh, being safe and belonging in that context, they're much more able to learn. Uh, in a chaotic or punitive context, it's much less likely that the child will be able to work through uh, the learning process. And positive school climates lead to social, emotional, and academic learning uh, together. And as I mentioned, you see the uh, opportunity for um, students to gain uh, an achievement as they uh, exist and learn in an environment like that. There are many opportunities uh, for social, emotional learning in ESSA. Some uh, states are taking it on as part of the definition of school success and school quality. Um, it can be part of the funding for continuous improvement and for comprehensive improvement in schools where indicators suggest that both academics are lacking and uh, the climate is unsafe or not productive. There are actual uh, funds for programs in Title IV as well as in Title I and um, assuming Title II survives, uh, the opportunity to invest in professional development for teachers to learn how to do this kind of teaching will be available. And I'm going to turn now to uh, Hannah, who's going to talk about how states are integrating this work into their ESSA uh, and continuous improvement processes. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, so one of the first ways that states are trying to encourage social and emotional learning uh, in schools is by measuring it and holding schools accountable for what really matters to kids. Um, so they can do that in many ways, um, and, and it's not just about um, identifying those bottom 5% of schools and um, making sure those schools improve. We think of the, that's an important piece of the puzzle. We call that the fifth indicator under ESSA, the federal indicators. Um, but there are also other ways that one can use measures to encourage SEL. Um, we, also, we look at state reported measures, so things that are reported publicly but not used um, necessarily to um, identify schools that are failing. State supported measures that um, can be tools or measures that are given to um, district locally if they want to measure something, it's not required. And then locally selected measures. For example, um, many uh, schools are starting to do their own surveys of SEL that you'll hear about later. So um, in our recent report, we took a look at some of these measures that might be most um, opportune for states to take up under ESSA, and we um, looked at where they might fit in an accountability system. We're really thinking about uh, who is going to be the end user of that data, how might they use it, and if you attach high stakes, is that going to change the data you're getting? Um, so some of the first measures we looked at are ones, uh, suspension rates and chronic absenteeism rates um, that were mentioned earlier. These are really um, not, they're proxies for school climate or social emotional learning, but they're related because they have to do with how engaged and supported students feel in the classroom. And many states are already taking them up in their ESSA plans. Um, so another really important um, measure of school climate is the school climate surveys um, of students, teachers, and, and parents um, that are already being used um, in many states um, and in some cases for accountability. Um, climate surveys typically measure some of the things Linda mentioned, safety, relationships, um, uh, trust among staff, and instructional support. 
And these surveys, um, there are several surveys that can produce valid and reliable data that have a long track record. Um, they do s spark some concerns in an accountability system. You need to be worried about things like reference bias. A student in a school where um, kids are really held to high standards might rate their school lower than a student who has low expectations of himself or his peers. Sure. <laughs> um, so you also might need to worry about gaming. Um, there are issues of, um, you know, perhaps the respondents will try to um, rate their school more favorably to um, give themselves a good score. However, you don't need to work. We um, have reason to believe that these might not be such a huge concern because New York City, Alberta, Canada, Chicago have been using surveys in their um, accountability system for a long time and have found that they are useful school improvement tools. So we therefore recommend that they be used, um, if not statewide, then to be supported by the state. Uh, and here's an example of how Illinois um, is reporting some of their school climate data. One, a really critical piece of having school, clim uh, school climate surveys is making sure the data are reported to the public in a very clear and understandable way so that people cannot just have this data sit on a shelf, but use it in their continuous improvement systems. Um, and here is an example from New York City of how they're reporting their data. Um, and I want to note that three states, Nevada, um, New Mexico, and Illinois, are thinking about using uh, climate surveys in their SS state plans, although they're going to be attaching very low stakes to them initially. Um, and so finally, one of the um, prominent uh, measures that we focus on as well are surveys of students social and emotional um, learning and their own competencies and other teacher observation tools or performance assessments that one can use to look at the student's learning itself. Um, districts like Washoe, Nevada, which you'll hear about, California's um, core districts are now using these surveys at scale. And they can be great tools in the classroom to really help understand where students or a whole class or school's needs are um, and where are their areas of strength. Um, however, we conclude that they are not yet appropriate for high stakes accountability for various reasons, um, but including that we just don't know about their widespread use in the classroom yet. Um, and we also are concerned that students might not have um, the best, be the just, best judges of their own competence. However, they really should be supported by the state to be for local use, since if used properly, they can be great tools in the classroom. Uh, and I just want to give a qu quick example of what I'm talking about when I say a school climate survey or social emotional learning survey. Um, in this slide, you can see on the left hand, um, you have some items that might be asked about students' own competencies. For example, I think about what might happen before making a decision. That's the student's level of responsible decision making. Whereas on the right hand side, you'll see questions about how the school is supporting SEL, the school climate question. This school encourages students to feel responsible for how they act. Those are the kinds of things we expect that schools should be held responsible for. Um, so I know you're probably wondering what can states do, what can districts do to encourage these really important um, competencies. So the first thing before even measuring some of these skills is setting the uh, standards or guidelines so that people have a common idea of what they're aiming for. Uh, and eight states are working with um, the Collaborative for Academic and Social and Emotional Learning, CASEL, to start developing these standards, um, which you'll hear about soon. Um, you can encourage uh, these surveys or other measures to shine a light on SEL. So that can be requiring some of the measures I just mentioned, or it can be providing a vetted clearinghouse of these measures, um, giving technical assistance or financial support for using them in schools. Um, once you have this data, what do you do with it? You need to identify and fund SEL curricula and interventions. Um, this is where federal um, funding can play a really critical role. Title I and Title IV both provide great opportunities um, for funding some of these at the uh, district level. Um, and the state can provide a clearinghouse of these vetted programs or interventions like RULER or Second Step. Um, they can provide technical assistance and how to implement them or grants for instructional materials. And finally, um, you can use, uh, ESSA provides opportunities for teacher training on social emotional learning via Title I or Title II. 
Mm -hmm. um, so you can have all the great data, you can have the programs, but teachers need to know what to do with it. And luckily, teachers almost universally want more training on social and emotional learning. That can be in service, um, or it can also be um, pre-service, because teacher preparation programs don't currently focus very much on SEL in general. Um, so HEA reauthorization can be a vehicle for reform or state teacher prep regulations as well. And finally, um, for folks who are local, what can districts do to support social emotional learning? So I mentioned some of the tools that might be used to measure SEL, but uh, observation tools are also things that we take a look at in our report, such as um, school quality reviews or um, observations of teacher practices or district practices using a rubric to get under the hood and why are you getting the school climate or suspension data that you are. Um, reforming disciplinary practices to really promote that positive so school climate that's the foundation for social and emotional learning. Uh, and building time for social emotional learning into the school day and teacher, teachers' professional development because teacher, teachers need the time carved out for them during the classroom day to make sure that they can address these important uh, competencies and they need planning time and they need the professional development time as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Leticia who's going to be um, allowing the panel to get into a lot of these topics in more depth. know who she is. Uh, Leticia Guzman Ingram is the 2016 Colorado Teacher of the Year. She is also the recipient of the Virginia French Allen Award for Excellence in Teaching. Uh, Leticia is currently a teacher at Basalt High School mm -hmm. and a commissioner for the National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Development, which I co-chair co with uh, former Governor Engler from Michigan and Timothy Shriver. Thank you, and I'm so honored to be here today. And as Linda said, I am currently teaching at Basalt High School, which is right in the middle of the mountains, 20 miles down from Aspen, Colorado. And uh, the reason I'm passionate about social and emotional learning is 58% of my students from my high school's first language is not English. It's almost the same percentage for free and reduced lunch. A lot of my students are from El Salvador, which is the number one hotspot for gangs. And you can't tell me they don't have social and emotional needs. They come over, they're seeking a better uh, life for themselves, and they know that education is the key to success. But they come with a lot of baggage in their head. And I feel it's so important that as educators that we need to teach them the tools of how to deal with their social and emotional needs. And then let's not forget the other 42%. If you sit in my classroom during lunch, you'll hear the other 42% of the student body talking about divorce in their family, cyberbullying, suicide. So many things they're dealing with, of course, with everything else that's going on in the world. Terrorists, it all scares them. Their friends are being deported. There's so much going on. And they're trying to figure out, how do I balance this? And how can they uh, learn academically if they don't have the tools of social and emotional needs on how to handle their needs? So I'm very passionate about it. And I'm so honored and excited that you're here and that we can work together in solving this issue. So I'd like to introduce the panel first. First of all, um, there's uh, Stefan Turnus. Turnipseed, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Destination Imagination at the end. He's also the former President of LEGO Education North America and the former Executive Director of Strategic Partnerships for LEGO's Education. Stefan is also the past Chairman of the Partnership for the 21st Century Skills, a national organization that advocates for the 21st century readiness for every student. So welcome. We also have Linda Darling-Hammond, who you just um, heard from, and she's also, as we say, we work together on, for the Aspen Institute for the National Commission on Social, Emotional, and Academic Needs, besides all the other things that she does, and I'm very honored to be a part of that with her. And at the end, we have Victoria Blakely, who is with the Office for a Safe and Respectful learning environment with the state of Nevada Department of Education. She was previously with the Anchorage, Alaska School District leading the social and emotional learning work. So I'm looking forward to hearing all they have to say and you can tell they come from different facets of life, business, research, and with the state. So 
we'll go ahead and begin with some of the questions. I'm going to get, begin with Stefan. He was uh, mentioning a quote, and I love this quote, and I thought it was great to start off this panel discussion today. Uh, if you could start off with that, and why you think that social and emotional development matters. Thank you. Let's see if I can get this. There we are. We're all right now? I'm always a little afraid of doing that. I, when I, you know, it, can you hear me? It's always one of those yes, but it may not be any better. Just, you know, you can still hear me. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, we were just talking earlier about the importance of social emotional learning in the context of, of civil society. And some of you, some of you who have had a few, many laps as I have on this race of life, and some of you have probably heard of it. Uh, then 1988, there was a book made popular by Robert Fulcrum, which said, uh, all I ever really needed to know I learned in kindergarten. And, and that's really true when we look at an increasingly uh, tense society, a society where children are increasingly faced with, with challenges that certainly I did not face as a child growing up, that many of you did not face. The ability for them to learn in, in kindergarten these success skills, these skills that allow them to, to understand who they are and, and understand how to interact with the world more effectively will be critically important as we consider the fact that in a very few short years, we're projected to be 11 billion people on this earth. When there's 11 billion of us, we're going to have to figure out how to deal with each other differently. And if we don't understand or don't figure out how to deal with each other with our words, not our fists, we deal with our words, we're going to increasingly have challenges and problems in this world that will be almost insurmountable. I personally believe that we have the capacity in our youth and the capacity in our society to deal with the world through our words. And that's the direction that we need to, to pursue and certainly why I think social emotional learning is critically important for the world of civil society. Thank you. Linda, would you like to add something on that? Why you think social and emotional development matters, especially in the academic and college area? Well, as I mentioned, um, increasingly, you know, employers are asking for this set of skills. And the work that you do in uh, college as well uh, is uh, requires uh, critical thinking and problem solving. The rapid change in knowledge and the expansion of knowledge is almost unheard of. Uh, it is unheard of in our experience. In the few years around the year 2000, there was more new knowledge in the world created than in the entire history of the world preceding. You have to figure out how you're going to learn to learn. You're going to have to take risks in order to do that. You've got to be resilient. You've got to be able to surmount obstacles. People can't spoon feed you the knowledge that you need, which means there are actually a lot of character traits that are needed of grit and perseverance and persistence and uh, risk taking uh, that are needed to learn in that kind of a context, both for college and then for the world beyond. Um, most of the the most in-demand jobs uh, 10, 15 years from now are not even, do not even exist today. So people are going to have to be flexible and adaptable and continually figuring out how to deal with challenges uh, and new technologies and so on that don't exist. And a lot of that is the social and emotional apparatus we bring to the world as much as it is the intellectual apparatus. Thank you. Um, Vicki. I, I wanted to address the next question to you. Is a social and emotional learning development something that is done in addition to academic learning? I know at my, you know, a lot of teachers I talk to, sometimes they feel like it's just another add-on. So I'd like you to expand on that and also in furtherance of academic learning. So, Sure, thank you. So um, when you talk about if it's one more thing added to the plate, sort of the saying that we say in... Um, social emotional learning is it's not something that we're adding to the plate, it's the plate itself. Uh, because if a student comes without the emotional and social readiness to learn, they can't learn. And so if they, for example, don't know how to listen to other people, to communicate effectively, to listen to other perspectives and learn from those things, if they are emotionally hijacked, they're afraid of what's happening on the playground that afternoon, things like that, then, then they are not in a readiness place to learn. So in terms of whether it's um, something that is one more thing or whether it works in furtherance of um, so academics, then 
it is. It's a mutually reinforcing skill. Um, Can I'll you give tell you me that classroom story you were oh, talking about? Sure. So I, I had the pleasure of teaching high school English. I was a high school English teacher at Service High School in Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, I had a group of students that were considered, um, they were chosen to be in this class because they were considered not likely to pass the high school qualifying exams. And it was a new year to us. So we were trying to figure out what kind of supports we needed for those kids. Um, Coincidentally, at the same time that I started teaching that class, I was reading one of your books. <laughs> and I, I became really interested in social emotional learning and I used them as my experiment. So I would teach language arts along with social emotional skills. So for example, the skills of um, how do you um, have, you called it grit or persistence. How do you um, delay gratification? How do you not care what's going on around you and, and focus your own attention on what it is you're trying to do? Uh, so we, we also built a lot of um, relationships. So when you talked about school climate and the importance of school climate, this was a group of kids that had not yet um, been engaged in a school system. They didn't know, t teachers didn't really know them. They didn't know teachers. It, they were, um, they didn't have peers. So we started taking care of their, their social and emotional needs as well as, and by we I had a co-teacher, so it was fabulous, um, as well as their, their physical needs and then their academic needs. Um, and the outcome for these kids, it, first of all, the fact that they became just this really lovely, close-knit group of friends, and they wanted to come to school because they wanted to see each other, right? If you don't have friends and, and you don't have a climate, and you don't think that teachers care if you're there, why would you show up? But, but now they believed that they belonged and they felt like they were part of something. And then they went to take their test. And um, we had, at that year, a 93% success rate on our, on our high school qualifying exams when the school average was 68%. Mm -hmm. And these were the kids not likely to make it, right? It was beautiful. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, Stefan, how and why should social and emotional learning matter to business and industry? And does it strengthen our economy? And you talked about the fourth industrial revolution when we were discussing it before. I'd love for you to expand on that. I, I, and congratulations, all of you here are recipients of the fourth industrial revolution. You are living it. You are making it real and, and likely will live through it and possibly a fifth industrial revolution is at the rate of technologic change. As you know, the changes that are going on now are being driven strongly by the Internet of Things, by the connectivity, by the networking of human capital and, and physical capital. And this networking is creating exponential growth and exponential challenges. As we network more, as we gain more experience and more uh, capacity, if you will, in business and industry, we face some interesting challenges. This is the first time in modern history when we've had four generations all coexistent working in the same workforce. Three was reasonably common with a fairly small percentage at the higher age, age ranges. Today, you may know this, but the number one group in ages 40 to 65 that are changing jobs, they're not 40-year-olds, they're not 50-year-olds, they're the 60-plus-year-olds mm. that are changing jobs. It's completely disrupting how we think about the relationships and the networking. So you can imagine how important it is that we be able to talk, we be able to communicate, we be able to collaborate across geography, across ge uh, time zones, across cultures. And into this world, we are spending almost $5 billion a year in the U.S. alone on simply interpersonal skills training, teaching people how to talk to each other, things that you should reasonably expect to have learned in kindergarten, however, somehow have gone lacking for a variety of reasons. And we can go in the, the, into all the reasons and, and uh, probably add ad nauseum. And it doesn't really matter how we got here. The fact is, we are here. And we have another generation that are coming through a system that has, was designed 100 years ago. And that system has served us well, the system of education, and it is not broken. It is doing exactly what it's designed to do. However, the economy, the society is changing far greater at a far greater pace than education can currently keep up. One of the areas that are so important to business and industry is our ability to take these people and actually create useful work 
Mm-hmm. And, and these are super important things that, that are necessary. And the policies that you create are the ones that allow us to, to let this happen. I'll step down off my soapbox here because this is actually a 45-minute rant. <laughs> uh, and and I'm, I'm going to condense it because I'm looking at the clock, and, to, and I don't want to be respectful of your time. But social-emotional learning is absolutely critical to the future of our society and the future of our business. And, and the more we can do to support that at earlier grades, the better we will be. Stefan, that gets me fired up. Thank you for that. <laughs> it's awesome. I'm sorry. I, no, I, just... I think it's like, go, you go. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just, Linda, could you add Yeah, I just want to add a little bit about what the pedagogies are that have to change and why you need professional development resources and, and support. And I know you could add a lot more uh, to this uh, from what you do in Nevada. Um, yeah, in the old uh, learning environment, it was kind of sit and get, you know, it was transmission curriculum. I'm the teacher, I know it, I'm going to say it out loud to you, tell you to read the chapter, answer the questions at the end of the chapter, take notes when I'm talking, uh, and you mostly kind of, you know, regurgitate the things that the textbook and I tell you. Uh, in this, you know, arena, and with the needs that uh, Stefan just described, uh, you've got to be able to create a classroom in which kids are actually constructing the knowledge together, mm-hmm. where they can productively engage in work with each other. How many of you have had bad experiences with group work? Okay, I got almost 100%. Uh, and that's because quite often, you know, as teachers are learning to do this new work, they haven't learned the skills necessarily, haven't been taught the skills for how do you construct collaborative work in a productive way that teaches people how to work effectively with each other, that uh, you know, intervenes in relationships that need to be adjusted, uh, helps people figure that out. When that doesn't happen, and you've all had that bad experience with group work, that's exactly the phenomenon that leads to the $5 billion industry for training and interpersonal skills that Stefan talked about. So we need to bring that into schools, uh, help teachers actually get the skill set. It's a very specific skill set um, to create a different kind of classroom, a different kind of learning experience, and a different kind of collaboration skill set for all of the kids that they have. And to build on that a little bit, Linda, sorry for jumping no, in again, but to build on that a little bit, all too often we've relegated the so-called soft skills to the beyond school environment to the speech and debate or, or the destination imaginations or the, uh, the clubs and, and activities. And, and I think you're making the great point. It's not good enough to, to delegate it to that area. It's got to come in the classroom. It's got to come in the classroom to be effective. It does. It needs to be integrated with everything, every content. Anyway, Vicki, you are also, I know that you are from Nevada and, and Governor Sandoval is also on part of the commission. Uh, for the Aspen Institute on uh, Social, Emotional, and Academic Needs. And he, yeah, your state is working on the Office of Workforce Innovation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, actually, and, and especially in light with how, how social emotional learning leads to academic or economic improvement, et cetera. So the governor has just started the Office of Workforce Innovation, and I had the pleasure of meeting with um, one of the workers in this particular office, and they have just put out a briefing. And the reason that I was mentioning that is when you talk about it with economics, even locally, um, the sectors of employment in Nevada were asked what skills they were looking for in their employers. And they broke it down by entry level, middle level, and senior level positions. And even at the entry level, the skills that showed up in those columns were the social and emotional skills, just like you've been talking about. They want people who can um, show reliability, people who can communicate well, people who can work in teams. And then as it went further up, it became you know leadership skills. So when you look at the skills that we're looking for, we're looking for the social and emotional skills. Not to mention the fact that in, in Nevada, we've also done some uh, research in Washoe County, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And they've done a strong correlation between um, social emotional skills and social emotional implementation and graduation rates. Right, and so we're able to graduate more students when we s- focus on their social and emotional needs, and of course that adds to a stronger economy. Adds to the workforce. It does definitely. So sometimes social and emotional learning and school uh, climate get conflated. What is their relationship, and how do both contribute to ending the school to prison pipeline and advancing equity? Stefan, could you address that? especially with your uh, experience in Alabama? Well, I I live in the great state of Alabama. Uh, 
and uh, I won't make any jokes about that. It is a great state for us. However, we have a lot of challenges in our state, as we do in many other states. We have challenges of equity. Uh, we have uh, huge, huge, huge issues of educational uh, imbalance uh, across the socioeconomic and uh, racial lines. And into this world, very often, as a result of perhaps unintended consequence of, of the high stakes testing, perhaps other societal issues, what we really find out is that the skill sets get uh, mixed up with the culture, the deep abiding values of the area, and the climate, how these, this culture is experienced. And in business and industry, we separate those three. We talk about the skill set, the culture, and the climate. And when you put them all together in a soup, what you really get is, is a lack of understanding on the part of the people that are involved as to what they're trying to learn, why they're trying to learn it, and how it's going to impact their experience in work and in school. And in school, when you, when you create that environment in school, you create, again, an environment that only exists in school. I don't know if you guys know this, but the only place in the entire world, well, let's confine it to the U.S., the only place in the U.S. that actually looks like school is school. There is no other, there is no work environment that parallels sitting like you're sitting now. <laughs> this is called, by the way, this is called instructionism. I'm telling you what I think is important. And if I were in a school, I would give you a test and you would prove to me I was correct. Okay? Uh, that's not how we do it. That's not how you do it in the world in which you live. And so to prepare children for that world, we have to separate very discreetly. These are the skills, the self-awareness, the self-management, the social skills, and these transcend just the school setting. And the climate is how you experience those in this classroom. They experience the climate of growth and excitement uh, as opposed to perhaps other classrooms in, in the school or in the area. And then the culture, what are the values, the underpinnings that, that make this, that we in civil society have declared to be appropriate and effective as you know, I grew up in the South, and we have a storytelling in the South is a survival skill. It's not actually a, an art form. And, and, and so my, my dear old daddy used to say, manners are cheap. There's no excuse not to have good manners. And when you think about it, there's really no excuse for not having good manners. They're easy to teach. They're easy to learn. And to your point, they're more caught than they are taught. And, and I would suggest that, that when you conflate these three areas, you make it very difficult for a child to sort this out. And you have to be much more clear about, about these three basic areas, in, in, at least in my opinion. Linda, Sorry. would you like to add something about the, how school climate gets uh, conflated and the relationship on how they both contribute to ending the school to prison pipeline also? I think that was a very good explanation. I'm going to let that stand. Okay. <laughs> You did do a good job summing that up. Okay, well, let's go on to the next one. How can states and districts support social and emotional learning in the systems of continuous improvement? I'd love to hear some examples. And Vicki, uh, I know the state of Nevada has supported social and emotional learning. Could you uh, give us some examples? Sure, it's a pleasure. I am fortunate to be working in Nevada's Department of Education right now. And currently, I work in something called the Office for a Safe and Respectful Learning Environment. And the first way that I feel like Nevada has really done um, good by our students is the formation of this office in the first place. So we are one of only two offices in the Department of Education that is legislated. The other one is uh, family engagement. So we have been legislated to be a part of the Department of Education, which I believe shows a really strong level of support for the building of safe and respectful learning environments. Um, we have a director, we have um, coworkers, and myself working in that office. And one of the ways that um, we work to support the building of social emotional learning in, in our students, and this is also another way that the state of Nevada has really stood up um, social emotional learning and supports is that we have been given the opportunity to place social workers in schools across the state. So we have $11.2 million a year that the legislators have given us to spread social workers into our schools. And then they become the voice for us of talking to schools about how to build social emotional learning. 
The other thing that we have in legislation is the formation of multi-tiered systems of integrated supports. And so we want to help our students learn these social skills through um, uh, strong universal teaching of social emotional learning. And then um, if they need extra supports, how can we offer those extra supports? And then we also have, like I said, our social workers in the schools that can help get there. So I feel like they've done a really lovely job of trying to put some of their money and their policies and their people behind the work that they're doing. Uh, we also have a statewide school climate social emotional learning survey, like you heard about in the opening. Um, and we're very excited about what we're going to be able to learn from that survey and how we're going to include that survey in uh, our systems and as part of our ESSA plan. And then we have called out social emotional learning as part of our ESSA plan. So our goal actually says students and adults will have social and emotional competencies. So we didn't forget that the teacher has to have the competencies, which we're really excited about. Um, and so to get there, we are now actively working to develop statewide social emotional learning standards. And we're trying to do that in a volunteer way. We don't want to force um, the teachers on the ground to be teaching social emotional learning. We just want to provide the technical assistance and support so that they can teach social emotional learning. And so to do that first, we believe that we need to be able to tell them what students should know and be able to do. So we're working on bringing together teachers, educators, um, parents, uh, students, just a, a wide group of stakeholders who are interested in this topic. And we're developing statewide SEL standards as we speak, hopefully to go to adoption soon. It's exciting. Go ahead, Stefan. I, I know, Victoria, you and I were actually speaking, and I, I don't think there's any longitudinal data on it at this point, but I, I would suspect that this is going to have a huge impact on lowering this, this whole school-to-pipeline, mm -hmm. our school-to-prison pipeline issue, mm -hmm. which is, is actually destroying so much human capital, mm -hmm. and, and it's disproportionately seen in the African-American community. In my state, if you're an African-American male, you're four to six times more likely to be in prison mm -hmm. than if you're white. And, and there, in many cases, it's because of a lack of these skill sets on both sides mm -hmm. that, that have. And so I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see how that plays out in, in, your, in, your, right. in Nevada. One of our, our favorite, and we talked about this a little bit, one of our favorite projects, or my favorite projects right now, is that when students um, are at some of those vulnerable decision-making points, so for example, they've, they've um, made it to the principal's office for some reason, um, we have a, a district that I'm really proud of, Lyon County, who is working on um, doing a behavioral health screener instead so that they can say, now, was this really a discipline issue? Oh, it looks like I'm going to be usurped very well. I'm excited to have you come. I, I will stop and give you space. <laughs> <laughs> you want to jump in? Well, we, we had a wonderful introduction thanking you, uh, Senator Murphy, for all your efforts on behalf of, I'm from the state of Connecticut, so especially proud to have you represent us and all your work during ESSA, the provisions that were in, included in the, in the final bill to support social emotional learning and ending the school to prison pipeline. So thank you for your tireless advocacy and the important equity guardrails in ESSA and your continued work. So we would love to have some welcoming comments, open, mid-welcoming mid comments from here. Thank you. <laughs> You'd love to have an interruption, is what you mean. Uh, well, uh, listen, I just uh, want to thank you all for um, uh, achieving a capacity crowd uh, here to uh, talk about you know, one of the most important subjects uh, right now uh, to our kids, and uh, that's um, the ability to understand uh, what our children need today, which is not just uh, learning basic skills and reading, writing, and math, but also the skills to be able to cope as productive workers, as productive collaborators, as productive uh, adults with uh, all of the ability to deal with the tumult and turbulence that is often thrown at them. So um, I, I've been a you know, great admirer of, of Linda's work for a, a long time. She works very closely, um, her organization has, with uh, my wife who spent her career in education, uh, now working in education policy. Um, and I'm proud of the steps that we took in ESSA to put social emotional learning um, on a fast track. Um, listen, I don't love everything that's in that bill. Um, that is a compromise in every sense of the word. I was the author of the accountability provisions in that bill, um, but it is a big, big bet on states. Um, we are giving enormous um, uh, ability to states uh, to innovate 
when it comes to their accountability systems. And we are really putting a lot of faith in local parent communities, in local activist communities, to hold states accountable to the commitments that they make inside those accountability plans. One of the most exciting shifts that happens in ESSA is the recognition that we have to have a much more holistic view about what makes a great school. Um, and the ability now to include in your uh, accountability system things like school climate um, are going to beg for uh, more and more instruction, more and more curriculum in social emotional learning, because now you are going to be rewarded for doing that through the law. Um, and yet we know we still have a lot of work to do to understand how to communicate these subjects to kids, understand what works and what doesn't, and then how to assess um, whether what we're doing in social emotional instruction um, is paying the dividends that we want. And that's why, you know, in Connecticut, we're so proud of the work that Yale does in particular uh, to, tr to try to do uh, the research that is long overdue uh, in uh, this field. Um, so uh, I'm just really excited to take a look at this report. Um, you should all be, you know, feel really lucky to be in education policy at this moment. Um, but also feel a tremendous burden uh, because um, lots of states can get this new system very right, but lots of states could potentially get it very wrong. Um, and letting states know that this is a time that you can take a leap of faith and prioritize social and emotional learning, um, letting them know that um, with good data, um, and good information like the, such that's included in this report uh, is really, really critical. Um, and you know, I'm 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 one of a very small minority in the United States Senate, which is uh, a parent of young children. Uh, so we have a very small cabal of us that have kids in the public school system. Uh, and so I've got a uh, incoming third grader uh, and an incoming kindergartner. And so this is. Um, both both a personal and professional uh, endeavor here, and I really wanted to welcome you all uh, to and thank you for doing uh, this uh, great work. Huge opportunities in ESSA to promote social emotional learning, but but big unanswered questions for a lot of teachers and principals about how to do it right. Um, and still big unanswered questions for policymakers at the state level as to whether um, they can measure this in a way that's meaningful to them. You're going to be engaged over the course of the next months and years in answering uh, those questions. So uh, to, to Linda, to all of the um, members of the panel here, to everybody that took some time out of your day to be part of it, uh, thank you. Thank you to Tim Ryan for caring about this in the House of Representatives as well, and I look forward to working with you all. I'm going to go vote. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you, Senator, and thank you for on behalf of all our educators for pushing that and being our voice because we really, really need that. So thank you. So I think this is a good time to go on to questions. So. We have about 15 minutes, so I'd love to hear some questions that you have in the audience for our panelists. So uh, just raise your hand and we will hear your questions. Okay, right here at the front. And just talk loud. Okay, here. here. Um, yes. I have a question. in the arts and in the athletics and in technology um, with healthy, healthier and um, across the board attention to social emotional learning. Um, I'm particularly concerned in a time that's pay to play. 
that we are separating out those uh, access for those things. And I also wonder if there is a workforce there that can help teachers learn from other teachers. Okay, who wants to jump at that? Sorry. I'll, let you take, I'll, I'll start, but I'll let you jump in with the research because I just have the practical experience. So in- Never say just. Oh, I do have <laughs> the practical experience. <laughs> So in the Anchorage School District where I started social emotional learning was, um, uh, we started by writing some SEL standards and then we went out to, um, actually we went to Connecticut by the way, but he's gone now to see what it looked like. <laughs> and, and then we began going from classroom to classroom and school to school and, and seeing what teachers wanted to do and how they wanted to build it. And we found that our, our music teacher, that's what made me think of that, our music teachers were some of the first bought into this. Um, because for them to uh, make beautiful music together, the kids had to, you know, work together. They had to be willing to practice on their own. They, they had to have those social emotional skills that we believe in. And then they had to follow direction and, um, you know, try to make sure that they blended instead of stood out alone all the time and things like that. So our music teachers and our art teachers and our um, specialists became extremely passionate about the work that we were doing. Um, in fact, we used um, some of our specialists uh, to to be the the curriculum teachers of the social emotional curriculum that we'd adopted because they see every student. So it's a little different than um, myself as a high school English teacher who saw the 120 students that were assigned to me, for example. Um, our specialists in our elementary school saw every student in the school. And so they could help bring these skills to the kids in a way that, that transcended what was happening in a classroom. So I, I don't know that that particularly answers your question, but I believe that our, our specialists have a, a huge role in this. And then of course, um, the, the ability to creatively express yourself and, and to um, paint the world a more beautiful place through the fine arts and through those things and through physical health. There's a direct connection between physical health and emotional health, right? I mean, it, it, there's so much research about that. All you have to do now, I can even show it to you. Just turn to the people around you and smile for a second. Everybody smile at somebody, okay? Now, you notice what happens in the room when you do that. You physically change your lips and the whole room starts giggling and laughing. There's a connection between your physical and your emotional health, right? So. Um, the more that we take care of the social emotional needs of kids, the more that we're taking care of the physical health of kids as well. It is, and I always, uh, that's why it saddens me sometimes when you hear about them cutting the arts too, because I believe it has a strong correlation with social and emotional needs, because that's the way a lot of kids express themselves. Okay, so does anyone know about the research with that and the arts? Well, there's a lot of research about the benefits of the arts. Um, and you know, for academics and cognitive development, um, certainly in the expressive arts, uh, there is research about the therapeutic benefits, which have emotional uh, components of engaging in, in the arts and um, using that self-expression as a means to be actually emotionally healing and so on. I don't know if there's you know, particular research on the um, advance of social emotional skills, but you would expect it to be so. And uh, every, all the evidence we do have um, you know, suggests that it is, as you say, a, a workforce that could be deployed um, in, in, uh, in this cause. Okay, thank you, ladies. Is there another question? Uh, this gentleman right here. Uh, I'm Tom Lindsley with ACT. And uh, the science and the research behind this has really grown exponentially uh, in the last five years for reliability. So with that foundation just continuing to get better, uh, more schools of teacher preparation are beginning to look at it and build it into curriculum. Can you talk or elaborate a little bit more on where you see that being done well uh, and the difference between that and professional development as a place for mm -hmm. this to occur best? So I will say a little word about that because it's a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, been in the teacher education program at, the Sta at Stanford University for a long time, and we've brought in quite a bit of work on social-emotional learning for both teachers uh, so that they can be well-centered and good models and uh, able to manage their own stress and interact uh, you know, appropriately with uh, their students, but also for students. Um, and so there are some places that are beginning to do that. We're doing case studies right now of 
uh, some schools of education as well as some schools that are good exemplars. And one of those is San Jose State University, where there's a really strong initiative to uh, infuse social emotional learning in pre-service for teachers and also to work in professional development with surrounding communities. And the, it can range the gamut from mindfulness practices, which are centering and calming and allow people to stop and think and behave, uh, you know, take the next steps more appropriately, to conflict resolution strategies that both teachers and kids can learn so that when a disagreement occurs or when there's some misunderstanding, people have tools and skills in common. Uh, you know, teachers, just like uh, anyone else, learn how to interact with others from whatever happened in their family or in their, you know, background, uh, which may or may not have been particularly sophisticated or skillful. Uh, you know, we all have different experiences in our homes. So they also you know, need to learn these skills, but having everyone in a school with the same tools can allow the culture and the, uh, to build around that. So that's something else that can be taught. Uh, and then ways to teach collaboration. We have a whole course in our program about how to teach kids to collaborate effectively and do group work that is productive of higher skills and achievement. So all of these things are things that teachers can learn. Um, practices like um, helping kids engage in uh, self-assessment with rubrics and peer assessment and then revising their work actually teach them an academic growth mindset that if I get feedback and follow it, my work will improve. It demonstrates that I'm competent. There's so many ways in which this integrates with the academics, but also can be taught as a set of uh, support um, skills for teachers. So it's exciting. Uh, there are a few other places that are taking this up. There's some work in Canada around pre-service. There are uh, some consortia that are connecting uh, within AACTE. So it's, um, it's a good time, but there's a lot of work to be done. A lot of work to be done. And I've seen this change a lot because I, I want to tell you exactly how many years ago I, I graduated college. It was a long time ago, but I didn't. I don't think I had one class on social and emotional dealing with that. So it's encouraging to hear that colleges are not the teacher prep programs are really trying to integrate it. So thank you for that question. Uh, next question. Okay, up here in the front. And can you state your name and where you're from and say? Um, my question was, uh, is there bipartisan support for ESL and ESL programs? or And if not, how do you see the, that affecting the future of uh, or SEL? Sorry. Okay, Linda, I think that one's for you again. Well, I'll, I'll start it off and others can add on. But um, I'll uh, begin by noting that um, uh, Senator from Nevada, I mean the Governor of Nevada, um, Sandoval, is a Republican and uh, supportive of social emotional learning and the Nevada Department of Education, uh, the arena that Victoria leads is one of the few required parts of the department which is on this point. Uh, the co-chair of the Social Emotional and Academic Development Commission, former Governor Engler from Michigan, is a Republican and was the head of the Business Roundtable until very recently. Um, of course, Tim Ryan and Chris Murphy, who you just heard about or from, are both Democrats, so you can see that there is um, support on both sides of the aisle. But when you get right down to it in the states and in communities, um, there is, I think, a recognition from, you know, human beings who care about getting things done in the world that these are the skills that are really important and that's a bipartisan and nonpartisan agenda. I can certainly say that from business and industry, it is definitely bipartisan. We, we all are going to sink or rise on this ocean and regardless of your political affiliation, you're going to have to do business and, and we need we need to do business in an effective way with an effective and informed consumer base and an effective informed work group. And, and this, this type of, of learning is, is critical to both. I think it's more important that we all work together at this time. Thank you. Okay, uh, the gentleman at the blue shirt right there. Uh, Caleb Hedinger, intern with NASB. Do you have any kind of concern in light of the uh, recent projection of some of the SS state plans that um, SEL components of future state plans might not 
be uh, of a high enough standard and what can states do to really compensate for that? Okay, um, was, was um, SEL something that was confronted in any of that feedback? I don't remember that it, it drew any. Yeah, I don't think that that was a source of any concern. Uh, and I, I think in school quality and student success indicators in the law, there might have been even a mention of, of yeah, the, the ideas of, of uh, students' climate surveys were, uh, were mentioned. The Department of Education has put out a climate survey, which it's advocated for states to use. I'm doing some work in New York right now, and they're using the U.S. Department of Education climate survey as a pilot, uh, intending for it to eventually uh, potentially become statewide. Um, so I think that the notion that uh, at least this work around climate surveys that give you information uh, about uh, supportive environment and students, you know, um, opportunities to learn these skills uh, are well established in the law and probably unlikely to be, um, you know, contravened in any way. You also, would you like to add a comment there? Just a comment that you know we've been using employee pulse. Uh, there's many different things, but we use something called an employee pulse routinely in industry, which is essentially a climate uh, ass assessment. And it would be unusual to me to imagine that what we have so successfully managed to use in, in business in our way would, would be rejected in schools as, oh, well, that doesn't work. <laughs> Well, I'll just say, of all the things that are going to be indicators for school people to use to try to improve, continuously improve their schools, getting data from student surveys about how they're experiencing the school uh, and from other potentially parent surveys and teacher surveys is some of the best data. I've worked in many schools. I've started some schools. When you can sit down with those data and say, well, how's our trend line going? Uh, oh, we've been working on this, and we can see the results in what kids and parents are saying is very motivating and informative for educators. So it's one of the most productive kinds of uh, improvement tools, an engine uh, for ongoing improvement that we have. Uh, and I think people are beginning to see the value of that where they're using it. And I think if there were any um, discouragement that were to appear, there would be a lot of advocates explaining why this is really central to improving the school environment. I know we do surveys at our school, and we really look at what's going on with the when we see our students' climate. And I see, oh, I got a low score on that, and I go talk to my class. I'm like, well, how can I do this better? You know, make you make sure you feel safe, and it really helps. It helps me a lot. And so, and of course, when you get high schoolers, you're all excited that they <laughs> that they feel really safe. But that's what you want. And as a teacher, you want your kids to, and as your educators in the room now, you want your kids to feel comfortable and safe in your classroom. They do better. They blossom. When they know you believe in them, they grow academically, you know, and socially, emotionally, always. Just like when your boss believes in you, you blossom. And when he doesn't believe in you, you wither. It's the same thing with our kids. So the surveys help a lot. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. The lady in the back. Oops, okay, let's do two questions because I know you had your hand up first. Sorry. Like we'll do two, two over, questions. There's two over there and one over here. Hi, um, my name is Julie. I'm with the After School Alliance. Um, I really appreciate the uh, attention to trauma-informed education and how SEL plays a huge component uh, with that and um, the conversation of how emotional is linked with physical and is linked with the academia side of learning. Um, with the current administration's propo uh, budget proposal for education and the huge cuts that uh, our states and communities are facing, how what roadmap do you recommend for un underserved communities who are already lacking the resources to carry out um, the basic education needs and health needs of their students? Um, how do you recommend that they still integrate this SEL component? That's a great question. Okay, go ahead. 
Well, I would, I would um, obviously, there's a big answer to that, which has to do with the equalization of school funding across communities and states. And there's you know, litigation in 40 states trying to, to accomplish that. Every state has its state bird, its state flag, and its state school finance lawsuit. But beyond, <laughs> beyond that, um, for schools that are identified for comprehensive intervention, uh, and improvement and the same thing for schools um, identified for targeted improvement. Um, there will be resources available. There's a huge pot of money in, in Title I. Uh, and uh, in, in settings where, in fact, there is significant poverty, trauma, et cetera, um, some of that money can be used for the wraparound services. We just did a big report at the Learning Policy Institute on community schools took a, a look at 125 studies which demonstrate uh, that both the pillars of community schools, the integrated supports, the extended time, the after school, the uh, family engagement uh, meet the, the evidence about their uh, effects on achievement and attainment uh, is strong enough to meet the ESSA standard for an evidence-based intervention. Uh, and so you would hope that in some of those settings that, that resource uh, will be put to use. And in that kind of context, social emotional learning and development, uh, as you well know from your own work, can really be planted and nurtured uh, and thrive. Okay, question over here. Senator, I'm Nick Yoder with the American Institutes for Research. Um, Senator Murphy mentioned there's a lot of unanswered questions still um, from measurement, and a lot of them have been addressed here, from trauma to teacher prep to connection to industry. What do you see as one of the biggest challenges, and how do you see your work moving forward in answering those biggest challenges? <laughs> That's a big small, question. I know, big question there. <laughs> well, AIR and SRI and many other organizations, uh, you know, Rand Corporation is involved in work on uh, SEL measures, uh, and, and um, I think, you know, in our case, we're very interested in how policies play out and affect student learning and achievement and growth. So we'll be looking very much at how are people taking up these tools, how are they using them effectively, what are the conditions under which you see uh, gains made, how can that inform future policy, and we'll leave it to many other research organizations to <laughs> fine-tune the measures and some of the other pieces of the puzzle that need to be um, part of what gets worked on. And I think, speaking on behalf of teachers, I think that um, one of the biggest uh, challenges or barriers is that we need to really support the adult in the building because it's it's a it's a tiring, exhausting, stressful job, <laughs> and um, and the more that I sometimes felt like I had to fight for the right to do my job, you know, and I just feel like teachers should be um, lifted up and and taken care of, and the more that we can teach them mindfulness skills, and the more that we can help them to feel um, that they have efficacy and that, and that they matter, and and that they these skills matter to them then they can model them the way that you were talking about them being modeled, and then it's not necessarily one more thing on the plate because it's their way of being. And I think that that is a, a, a huge barrier when, when an educator is so burned out that they feel like if you ask them to do this one more thing, it might break them, rather than helping them to have the time and the space for this to be who they are so that it's just the way that they teach. Stefan, would you like to make the last comment? I, I just make a comment to all business people, policymakers, all of parents, grandparents. We have to get off the porch. Mm -hmm. This is our fight. It's not the fight of any particular group. We have been treating education far too long as a rental unit. We rent it for the 12 years we need it and then we abandon it. That is not acceptable. If we're going to, if we're going to have an economy that is vibrant, a society that grows into this future that is so wonderful, we are going to have to treat education as an investment. And we're going to have to invest our time and our energy, no matter what our background is. And it's not a fight that we can, that we can just relegate to, to the policymakers or to the teachers. I, I firmly believe that if we are successful in liberating the classroom from the things that are done that are not instructional, that their teachers are required to do, and I don't mean 
<laughs> chaos. I mean, liberating the classroom so that teachers and children can have the relationship that they need in order to effectively have a learning environment. If we're successful in doing that, we will have solved so much of the issues that then the content issues, the instructional issues, those things will begin to be solvable. But right now, we don't even have that in front of everybody. And, and I, I call on everybody, all business people, parents, grandparents, get off the porch and get in this fight. Because if we don't get in it, we're going to lose it. I think it's a great way to end it. And let's go work together to liberate the classroom. And thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you, Tom.